When it comes to the depiction of ninjas in American pop culture, one can't resist visualizing short, green adolescents with hardened shells and an incessant craving for pizza. You guys eat pizza? Doesn't, Doesn't everybody? everybody? The world has witnessed numerous adaptations of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, each sporting varied aesthetics, tone, and plot. But for our money, none of these adaptations can match the popularity of the 1990 feature film, the first cinematic portrayal of the heroes in a half shell. Now recognized as a classic within the superhero genre, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film adeptly blends elements from the grim, black and white comic books with the vibrant, whimsical charm of the 1980s TV show, and in doing so, successfully secured the Turtles a place in the stratosphere of pop culture iconography. Radical. So let's embark on an exploration of this comic book adaptation to uncover how the filmmakers translated the saga of mutated juvenile ninjas from comic to screen. It's time to ask, what's the difference? The transition from the 70s to 80s marked an exhilarating period for comic books, which pivoted from moralistic narratives of good and evil to a focus on character-driven stories with more sophisticated themes. It was within this landscape that the concept of mutant ninja turtles, who just so happened to be teenagers, emerged. I did this drawing of a turtle with uh, a mask on and nunchucks strapped to his arms to make Peter laugh. So then I had to do my own version of it, kind of dueling sketches, and ended up Kevin drew a, made a drawing of four turtles. So we, then we had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The inaugural issue of Ninja Turtles was intended as a one-off, a pastiche of the comics that inspired creators Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. Frank Miller's Ronin, Marvel's New Mutants, Daredevil, and the satirical indie comic Cerebus the Aardvark. Born out of those influences was a monochromatic epic featuring mature scenes of anthropomorphic ninja violence. Despite replacing the comic's brutal black and white panels with a softer aesthetic, the film's turtles were far from watered down. In fact, the first issue of the comics doesn't offer much distinction between their looks or personalities. It was the 1980s TV show that added distinctive colors to their clothing and amplified their personas to a cartoonish degree. And with that, I think it's time for a turtle roll call. Ooh, I do love a good roll call. Well, then kick it off, my cinephilic compadre. Leonardo, the de facto leader of the group who holds himself to a high standard. In the book, Leonardo exudes stoicism and discipline. At times, his dialogue is scarce due to his unwavering concentration. However, in the film, Leo's discipline is counterbalanced by an exuberant teenage immaturity. Suck it to me, baby. Raphael, the outsider with a volatile temper and prone to isolation. In the book, Raphael grapples with reckless aggression, which, left unchecked, could easily result in the loss of life. The film, however, focuses on how his anger alienates his brothers. I think he's actually turning red. <gasps> uh, hmm. Donatello, the inquisitive tech geek. In the book, Donatello's scientific curiosity is both a boon and a bane, as it sometimes leads him into danger. The film, however, portrays the downside of his curious mind as a lack of cool. A recurring gag involves him attempting to assimilate his brother's lingo, usually to comical failure. Bossa Nova! What? Yeah. Bossa Nova? Chevy Nova? Oh. <sighs> and lastly, there's Michelangelo, the playful party dude. <laughs> In the comics, Mikey is tender-hearted with a soft spot for animals and a childlike sense of play. The film depicts him as a class clown with an insatiable appetite and a bodaciously sized crush on the movie's female lead, April. She's a babe. April O'Neil, the headstrong and self-sufficient reporter, is plucked straight from the TV show, given that her comic book counterpart is not a reporter at all, but a computer programmer assisting with a rodent extermination project. Unlike the comic, it's O'Neill's reporting that establishes the setting and the stakes in the movie's opening sequence, where she describes a New York City consumed by a crime wave conducted by an invisible organization. The movie introduces its protagonist by drawing inspiration from the first few frames of issue one of the comic, wherein the Ninja Turtles eliminate a hardened street gang in a scene of gunfire, blades, and blood. By framing the Turtles' first battle as a rescue, the film makes clear that the Turtles do not escalate violence to that extreme, trading the comic's blood-splattered panels for neatly tied-up criminals. Clearly, the film seeks a broader, younger audience than a straight adaptation of the comics would have allowed. Awesome. With the film's setting, stakes, and protagonists firmly established, the next step was to introduce its theme, family, specifically the relationship between father and child. 
Following their inaugural battle, the Turtles celebrate with an exuberance one would expect from teenage brothers. They, however, temper their zeal when in the presence of their father figure, Master Splinter. With their first battle won, Master Splinter explains that his reason for training his sons in the way of the ninja is to prepare them for his inevitable demise. His hope is that by teaching them to keep to the shadows and protect themselves, they will be able to live peacefully after his passing. Splinter's comic book counterpart trains the turtles not out of a sense of parental necessity, but for a specific mission of vengeance, a mission resolved by the end of the first issue. This brings us to the differences in the origin story and the role of the antagonist, the Shredder. Does anybody have any idea about who or what this is? In both mediums, Splinter was once the pet rat of a master ninja, Hamato Yoshi, who was forced to flee Japan with his love, Tang Shen, after a jealous rival threatened their lives. In the film, that rival was Oroko Saki, who would later become known as the Shredder. In this adaptation, Saki hunts down Master Yoshi and Tang Shen in New York City, making good on his threat and leaving Splinter to wander the sewers alone. The outcome is the same in the source material, however it approaches the tragic events with an even darker tone. Master Yoshi competes for Tang Shen's love not with Oroku Saki, soon to be Shredder, but his elder brother, Oroku Nagi. Master Yoshi kills Nagi in a fit of rage upon finding an injured Tang Shen in Nagi's violent grip. At Oroku Nagi's funeral, an infuriated Oroku Saki swears vengeance on the couple for killing his brother, and after years of training under the guidance of the foot, dons the name the Shredder, travels to New York, and murders Master Yoshi and Tang Shen in cold blood. The movie introduces a small detail to Yoshi's death that isn't present in the comics. As Saki kills his master, Splinter lashes out, disfiguring Saki's face while Saki slices off a piece of Splinter's ear. Years later, both still bear the scars of their encounter. Shredder obscures his defacement with the iconic metal mask while Splinter carries his wounded ear with humility. In this manner, the film establishes the contrasting life philosophies of these two characters. We will punish these. Creatures. Under the moniker of the Shredder, Saki leads the New York branch of the Foot Clan, acting as much a crime boss as he does a ninja assassin. The comic depicts him in a suit and tie, intimidating local businessmen into paying for protection, an aspect of Shredder's character that is wholly absent from the film. Indeed, the movie doesn't delve much into Shredder's motivations. All we know is that he preys on young outcasts, using them as petty thieves and training them to be ninjas in a compound that echoes Pinocchio's Pleasure Island. <laughs> Skateboards and cigarettes, arcade cabinets, this place is the best. We explore this facet of Shredder's organization primarily through the eyes of Danny. That's what he does when he wants to ignore me. A frustrated young boy with a strained relationship with his own father. You are here because the outside world rejects you. This is your family. By reimagining the comic book's evil Foot Clan as a gang of lost youths, the film effectively pits two father figures and their respective sons against each other. This deepens the film's early focus on the theme of father and child relationships. Shredder exploits his children for ambiguous personal gain, while Splinter guides his sons with selflessness and love. I am here, my son. Splinter's parenthood begins with the origin story of the Turtles in both mediums. However, the film features striking differences from the source material. Eastman and Laird's comics contain a number of references to Marvel's Daredevil. The Foot Ninja Clan is a parody of Daredevil's nemesis gang called The Hand, and Master Splinter's name is derived from Daredevil's mentor, named Stick. Furthermore, in the origin stories for both Daredevil and Ninja Turtles, a young man intervenes when a truck nearly strikes a blind pedestrian, causing a canister of mysterious ooze to come loose and strike the Good Samaritan's face. Stan Lee used this event to blind Matt Murdock and change him into a superpowered vigilante. Eastman and Laird took that event further by having the ooze bounce into a tank of newly purchased pet turtles, causing a mutation that grew both the turtles and Splinter physically and mentally. The movie omits the chain of events that led to Splinter and the Turtles becoming covered in the ooze, leaving that mystery for its lesser beloved sequel to explore. The main protagonists and antagonists firmly established, the film adapts one final character from the source material, the hockey mask wearing vigilante, Casey Jones. In both mediums, Casey Jones is a sports enthusiast who's tough on crime. In Raphael's standalone issue, Casey Jones is influenced by hard-boiled cops and vigilantes, the kind who punish lawbreakers with deadly force. Two minutes, full high stick. How about a five-minute game misconduct for roughing, pal? Movie Casey Jones fights with a similar brutality, but the film doesn't mention any of his influences, choosing instead to give him a backstory not featured in the comics. Casey reveals he used to play professional sports until an injury prematurely ended his career. 
The film demonstrates how a man devoid of purpose, filled with anger and resentment, can fall into a cycle of violent behavior disguised as justice in a perceived world full of scumbags. In both mediums, worlds clash when April O'Neil finally meets the Turtles face to face. In the film, a resolute April presses forward with her probe into the elusive Foot Clan. Consequences for her tenacity catch up with her as the Foot Ninjas corner her in a subway station. Yet, Raphael steps in, saving her from assassination, after which she awakens in their home in the sewers, where she transitions from a face on their television screen to their steadfast ally and friend. The comics introduce April to the Turtles in a less grounded way. Originally, April discovers her boss plans to use his rodent hunting robots to hold the city ransom. In a twist of irony, she's tossed into the sewers to be devoured by the very project she helped create. Yet fate intervenes in the form of the Turtles who step in to prevent her untimely demise. Splinter. The movie's second act is set into motion when the foot kidnaps Splinter. <laughs> With Splinter missing, Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo find themselves in the very situation Splinter was preparing them for. They are on their own. Splinter also goes missing in the source material, however the circumstances couldn't be more different. In the comics, Splinter narrowly escapes the rodent-seeking robots when two men from the mysterious TCRI Corporation retrieve his broken body and hospitalize him at their headquarters. This storyline unfolds in the most outlandish way, involving brain-like aliens, an intergalactic war with Triceratons, a robot with human consciousness, and so on and so forth. The film, however, remains grounded on Earth. Splinter is held captive at Shredder's compound, where he lends a sympathetic ear to the troubled young Danny. Well, half an ear, at least. Meanwhile, the Turtles take refuge at April's apartment, located above a dusty antique store that once belonged to her father. I don't know, I guess it's kind of dumb to lose money on a business just because you miss your father. No, it isn't. Tensions rise when Raphael accuses Leo of poor leadership. An argument ensues, and Raphael leaves to cool off on the roof. Great! Go ahead! We don't need ya! This contentious moment is lifted from a darker scene from the comics, where Splinter's absence causes Raphael such distress that he lashes out during a sparring match with Mikey, almost beating his brother to death with a wrench. Where's Raphael? <laughs> While on the rooftop, movie Raphael is overpowered by the foot and sustains life-threatening injuries. A horde of ninjas descend upon the group, forcing April, Casey, and the Turtles to retreat to a farmhouse upstate to recover, a sequence borrowed from the comics. Hey, didn't they use this place in the Grapes of Wrath? In both mediums, each turtle has their own way of dealing with their first major defeat. In the comics, it's Leo, not Raphael, who sustains the most severe injuries from the foot, which he takes as a personal failure. He spends his time alone in the woods hunting and self-pitying. Movie Leo also internalizes the defeat. However, it's not a question of his skills falling short. His perceived failure lies in his role as a brother. He shoulders the guilt, feeling that it was his unkindness that put Raph in harm's way, thereby expanding the film's theme of familial bonds. Donatello deals with his defeat by becoming Mr. Fix-It in both mediums. In the comics, he takes on all the house projects, preparing the windmill, the heater, the boiler. The film consolidates Don's penchant for tinkering into a scene originally written for Raphael in the comics. Here, Donatello bonds with Casey while getting an old truck to run again. <laughs> Movie Raphael spends much of the time at the farm lying unconscious in a bathtub. Been there, man. A far cry from the comics, which depict Raph as perpetually on guard, keeping watch to soothe his mind and exercise his body. <sighs> Boy, we missed you. Michelangelo is noticeably not featured in the movie's emotional healing montage, which was seemingly a last-minute change in post-production. In the comics, Mikey's attitude is solemn. He takes up residence alone in the barn and spends his time training fervently. The movie only shows a quick shot of Mikey tenaciously beating up a punching bag, then cuts to an exterior of the barn where Raphael cries out their master's name. <laughs> However, upon closer inspection, one can see that the color of the turtle's mask has an orange hue, and Mikey's weapons are holstered in the belt. It seems the film originally intended to portray the isolated and dour Mikey from the comics, but was cut in post-production. With the help of ADR, Mikey's uncharacteristic outpouring of anguish is instead given to Raphael. Leonardo. Splinter! In both mediums, Splinter guides the turtles back together, helping them find strength as a unit once again. In the comics, Splinter does this in person, as he had long since been retrieved from his hospitalization at TCRI, unlike the movie where he is still held captive by the foot. 
Movie Splinter appears to his sons as a spiritual projection, summoned by the turtle's collective meditation. It's an emotional scene that shows the brothers have healed through their camaraderie, which Splinter acknowledges with fatherly pride. I love you all, my sons. For this scene, the movie draws inspiration from a storyline in issue 9 where Splinter uses meditation to switch bodies with a dying old man. The gentleman needs Splinter's help to pass on his family's samurai spirit to his grandson before he passes. The themes of family and spiritualism made it a perfect concept to adapt into the film. With the turtles healed, both emotionally and physically, it's time for them to head back to New York City to face Shredder head-on in the third act, albeit under different circumstances than in the source material. In the comics, the Turtles first have their showdown with Shredder in issue 1 after Splinter gives them the mission to avenge Master Yoshi. Although the mission is successful, Shredder is reborn by issue 10, and so their return from the farm is to face the newly revived Shredder. The movie naturally saves Shredder's revival for the sequel. Revenge. Their final conflict in this film follows issue 1, but there is a significant shift in Shredder's defeat. In the comics, a bloody battle ensues, leaving Shredder with a hole in his torso courtesy of Leo's katana. Rather than ending his life honorably by committing seppuku, Shredder engages a thermite grenade in hopes of taking the turtles with him. Ultimately, it's Donatello who lands the killing blow, knocking Shredder off the roof where he explodes to pieces. Movie Shredder, on the other hand, almost defeats the turtles by exploiting their fear of Splinter's demise. Ah, oh, the rat! Huh? So it has a name. It had a name. Uh, you lie! Do I? <laughs> Just as Shredder is about to deliver the final blow to Leonardo, Splinter arrives to seize control of the situation and tosses Shredder over the side of the roof with a well-timed twirl of Mikey's nunchaku. Unlike the comic, the film refuses to allow our protagonists to deal a killing blow. Instead, Shredder falls after a desperate attempt to kill Splinter causes him to lose his grip. And although Shredder falls multiple stories into a garbage truck, which is surely enough to end anyone's life, Casey Jones lives up to his comic book reputation by activating the truck's garbage press, resulting in a bloodless yet brutal end to the Shredder. Or so it seems. Dum 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 implied. In the final scenes, the movie wraps up its theme of family. Danny reunites with his father, an eroded relationship made stronger. The young foot ninjas, no longer under the manipulative influence of Master Shredder, are free to find their own paths. Get your answers there. And the two lone wolves, known as April O'Neil and Casey Jones, find a partner in each other. Unlike the comic's stoic first issue, the movie's ending is joyful and celebratory, punctuated with the catchphrase made famous by the Saturday morning cartoon. <laughs> that sums up the entire adaptation. The source material provides the concept, setting, and general conflict, while the characters more reflect their Saturday morning counterparts. It forgoes the comic's most outlandish plots to stay grounded while dialing down the violence for broader appeal, tying all the adapted material to the theme of family. Even in an era saturated with the superhero genre, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles remains arguably one of the most successful comic book adaptations of all time. Where did they come up with this stuff? Well, that's it for this episode, folks. What was your favorite Ninja Turtles adaptation? Let us know in the comments, and in the meantime, rest assured that we here at Cinefix are crouched in the shadows, continuously on the lookout for fresh adaptations to scrutinize with intriguing subtleties to decipher. Let's I'm the leader of the video. Show what you have bronchitis. Remember to like and subscribe for more explorations into the compelling world of adaptation right here on Cinefix. Tubular, bodacious. Oh, you don't have to do that. Come on, Clint. It's hip teen vernacular. I don't know. Is it?